Welcome everyone to our Resilient Nation Partnership Network Virtual Forum Series, Alliances for Climate Action. My name is Bradley Dean, and as part of my role with FEMA, I lead our Resilient Nation Partnership Network. To those of you that joined us last week, thank you again for joining us. For those of you joining for the first time, welcome. Many of you are familiar with the Resilient Nation Partnership Network, but for others, this is your first experience. This is a unique network of organizations and individuals united to help communities take action and become more resilient. We have three priorities that guide our efforts, promoting natural hazard mitigation and climate adaptation actions, advancing equitable resilience initiatives, and expanding capacity through partnerships. In six years, the network has grown to include representation from over 600 organizations across all sectors. Over 800 unique organizations registered for this year's virtual forum series. That number is incredible, and we know it will take the efforts of the whole community to become a more resilient nation. Everyone is welcome to join the network, and we're humbled to see the turnout for this event. That brings us to today, day two of our Alliances for Climate Action Partnership Forum. It is time to take a big step towards accomplishing our shared mission, mitigating the impacts of climate change. Today, we will focus on climate migration and manage retreat, literally when climate moves communities. We have incredible panelists and storytellers who will dive into this extremely difficult topic. A reminder that throughout the series, our team will be capturing your feedback. So please take advantage of the chat function, share comments, resources, collaborate opportunities, gaps, and Apologies for the the reverb there. I would now like to introduce a leader at the state level taking clear action. Confronted with the challenges of rising energy costs and a changing climate, Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker has taken nation leading steps to diversify the Commonwealth's energy portfolio, safeguard residents, municipalities, and businesses from the impacts of climate change, and secure progress towards greenhouse gas reduction targets. Thank you for joining us, Governor Charlie Baker. Thanks, Bradley. And uh, before I be begin my prepared remarks, I just have to say that when I read the title of this particular engagement, When Climate Moves Communities to Action, uh, all I could think about was 20 days after I was sworn in, in January of 2015, um, where we were having a very mild 40 and 50 degree weather winter, uh, it started to snow and it snowed for 28 days in a row. And um, that was my introduction to some of the issues associated with climate, um, not just here in the Commonwealth, but elsewhere. And it was also my first experience with mutual aid, where we had um, people in gear coming from all over the Northeast to help us deal with the fact that it literally did not stop snowing uh, for almost a month. And I think in many respects for me, that was the proverbial baptism by fire. But there have certainly been plenty of circumstances and situations since then that have solidified certainly my view that there's a lot of work that needs to be done here with respect to mitigation. And I, and I would just add that I was on a National Governors Association panel a few years ago with some folks from FEMA. And one of the folks from FEMA said that if you looked at the amount of dollars that FEMA had put out the door in the previous five years and compared it to the number of dollars they put out the door in the previous 15 or 20 years, um, it was astonishing how close uh, the previous five had been to the 15 or 20 before it in terms of total dollars because of both the severity and the frequency of storms and storm damage uh, and the impact that that had had on, on communities, which obviously FEMA ended up responding to. So I'm thrilled you're having this conversation and I'm thrilled to be able to participate in a conversation about climate resilience and about community action. Since getting here in 2015, we've spent a lot of time working to build more resilient communities that are better prepared for coastal storms, sea level rise, and the other challenges that are presented by a changing climate. Our experience with COVID-19 has only reinforced the importance of being prepared and investing in the resilience of our communities. Earlier this year, we worked with our legislature to incorporate comprehensive climate change legislation that codifies into law the commitment that we made to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 and further the Commonwealth's nation leading efforts to combat climate change and protect vulnerable communities. 
We've already experienced, as I said before, many of the impacts associated with climate change, and we certainly anticipate that these will only intensify over time. This previous summer, we experienced four significant heat waves, more than 25 days of over 90 degrees, three tropical storms, a record amount of precipitation, and significant flooding across the state. And we're in the northeast part of the United States. When I talked to my colleague, uh, Governor John Bell Edwards in Louisiana, uh, his story makes mine look like a walk in the park. And that's why, to some extent, our efforts collectively to build climate resilience, not just across the Commonwealth, but across the country, are so critical. Beyond the impacts to our health and our homes, climate change also presents significant economic impact for our state and for the Northeast region generally. The Northeast is projected to experience some of the most drastic impacts from climate change, from extreme temperature to drought impacting crop yields, we do have a fairly significant agricultural presence here to significant inland flooding, which will threaten homes, businesses, and critical municipal infrastructure. And as many of you know, the Commonwealth's been around a long time, and as a result, a lot of that infrastructure is old. We have approximately 370 miles of fortifications and seawalls, 3,000 dams, 10% of which are deemed to be high hazard, and more than 25,000 culverts and small bridges, almost all of which were constructed more than 70 years ago. At the local level, there are 1,100 municipally owned coastal structures in 52 coastal communities that need significant funding to bring these deficient structures back to their operational top performance levels. And under the executive order that we issued several years ago, 569, we established an aggressive strategy using sound science to prepare the Commonwealth for climate change with the development of a state hazard mitigation and adapt adaptation plan and the launch of the Resilient Mass Action Team to ensure that our progress building resilience across state government would continue to expand our investments and in adaptation strategy statewide and as a result of that, we've spent about a billion dollars since coming into office to respond to the challenges associated with climate change and mitigation. Earlier this year, we also announced a $21 million series of grants to cities and towns through our Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, which represents a doubling of the program budget since last year. And to date, this program has awarded about $65 million to communities to use in their climate planning and mitigation and adaptation strategies. This is a voluntary program. It was started several years ago uh, by our administration under an executive order. No city or town in Massachusetts had to participate. The current Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Katie Theoharides, was actually the person we brought in to develop and run this program. And since that time, of the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, 328 of them, or 93%, have chosen on a voluntary basis to participate in climate resiliency, planning, and action. That's because they all see with their own eyes the consequences associated with storm severity and frequency, heat, drought, and the many snow, and the many other issues we deal with in their own communities. We've managed to fund over 230 implementation projects that range from hazardous dam removal and culvert right sizing to tree planting and ecological restoration. And we're proud of the numbers, we're proud of the level of participation we've gotten, and we're proud of the significant investments that we've been able to make in a majority of communities across the Commonwealth to address many of their priority climate adaptation needs. But it obviously represents only a fraction of the significant and urgent needs that our communities face with respect to this issue. The risks from flooding, extreme heat, and other climate impacts are increasing, and the time for our state to do more, much more, is now. And there are many, many more projects across the Commonwealth that could increase the resilience of our state and deliver significant benefits to our people and to our communities. And that's why our administration earlier this year proposed legislation that would put $2.9 billion in federal ARPA funds to immediate use to cities and towns across Massachusetts to address many of the urgent challenges that face them. And as part of that, we proposed nearly a billion dollars for critical environmental initiatives 
including $300 million to invest in climate resilient infrastructure and $400 million to support needed upgrades and modernization projects for critical water and sewer infrastructure. Our municipal partners through this MVP program are clearly demonstrating that the Commonwealth's ready to take on the challenges associated with local resilience and opportunities associated therewith. And in addition to that, they have ARPA funds that they can put into this. And I want to thank the administration and the Congress and the Senate for making it possible for us to apply these resources to these kinds of initiatives here in the Commonwealth and around the country. There's obviously a lot more work that needs to be done. We look forward to a continued partnership with respect to this, and we're going to continue to lead by example. This spring, we started a new climate resilience design standard tool to better incorporate climate resilience into our statewide capital planning process and develop consistent design standards across agencies. Our Office of Coastal Zone Management has also funded coastal communities like Orleans on the Cape to relocate public assets outside of flood zones. This seeks to maintain the use of public amenities as long as possible and enhance the ability of coastal resources like dunes to provide storm damage protection and flood control and minimize the loss of infrastructure. In addition, our Office of Public Safety and MEMA continue to maintain strong working relationships with FEMA and with DHS on both the state and national levels, building resilience through the Disaster Recovery Reform Act that was signed into law in October of 2018. As you folks know, this act made sweeping changes to improving mitigation response and recovery programs, allowing the emergency management community to continue to improve coordination before, during, and after disasters, and increasing the speed by which our Commonwealth and other communities will rebound after a disaster. MEMA leads an established federally funded hazard mitigation program and the state hazard mitigation plan is a requirement to receive Stafford Act funding. In the past 12 years, FEMA has awarded over $86 million in hazard mitigation assistance. Now, as recently as August of this past year, the Commonwealth received a major disaster declaration in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and will be eligible to receive 4% of those disaster costs through that hazard mitigation grant program to invest in climate adaptation and hazard mitigation projects to reduce risks from natural disasters and climate change. And as such, Massachusetts will have more than $110 million available to operate with statewide. Additionally, the Disaster Recovery Unit at MEMA coordinates delivery of these three disaster assistance programs, the FEMA Public Assistance Program, the FEMA Individual Assistance Program, and the Small Business Administration's Disaster Loan Programs, it's vital that the emergency managers associated with these take an active part in all aspects of planning for and implementing climate adaptation. And we're proud to be able to partner with you and with others here in the Commonwealth to continue to lead the nation on these initiatives. And believe me, we know there's a ton of work that's left to be done in many respects. I could argue that our work is just beginning and we look forward to continuing to build on our partnerships with our federal partners to create sustainable and resilient communities, not just across the Commonwealth, but across the country for generations to come. And again, I appreciate the chance to speak today, and I very much appreciate the relationship that we have, Bradley, with you and with the folks at FEMA on so many of these critically important issues. Governor Baker, your leadership to reduce the impacts of climate change and natural hazards on your constituents has truly been remarkable. And it's awesome to see the work Massachusetts communities are doing to be proactive when taking action against future climate change impacts. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today and the perspective that you were able to provide to our audience. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Pablo Mendez Lazaro, Associate Professor at the Department of Environmental Health at the University of Puerto Rico Graduate School of Public Health. He is one of six scientists nominated by the governor of Puerto Rico and confirmed by both the House and Senate of Representatives of Puerto Rico for the Executive Committee on climate, the Climate Change Adaptation Plan. He is the lead for the U.S. Caribbean chapter of the upcoming Fifth National Climate Assessment. Dr. Mendez Lazaro will be telling his story entitled, Discover Puerto Rico, the Shining Star, Enjoy Powerful Hurricanes, Frequent Droughts, 
and long-lasting blackouts. We welcome Dr. Mendez Lazaro. Thank you, Bradley, and thank you um, for inviting me. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to give thanks to the organizer for inviting me and for this alliance for climate change actions. Um, for me, it's an honor to be here with all of you and to share this with the rest of the audience. Um, I, I use this title because um, maybe you don't know this, but a couple of years ago, almost like a decade ago, um, the Puerto Rico Tourism Company was using this um, like a slogan in order to, to bring more visitors to come to Puerto Rico. And literally now today, it sounds like, uh, like an irony if we're all seeing what is happening here in Puerto Rico. So I will start with my, with my experience and what we have been doing um, for the last couple of years, um, working with communities and, and maybe where we are located in the context of climate change. Um, climate change are, and extreme weather events are of interest worldwide, even the potential for substantial impacts on social, ecological, and technological systems. Many climate-related events are increasing in intensity, duration, and frequency due to anthropogenic climate change, and there is an increased potential for impacts due to the location of urbanization and critical infrastructure, as the Governor Roy Baker was mentioning. The health and economy island states and territory are vulnerable to extreme events associated with climate change, atmospheric conditions, but also marine hazards. Traditionally, underserved communities and island territories are systematically excluded from welfare, education, and other societal services and benefits that can help sustain good health conditions. Addressing vulnerability of communities requires information and strategies to mitigate risks which chronically affect and define their social fabric and health. For example, many populations in Puerto Rico have historically been underserved and therefore disproportionately exposed to higher risk of cardiovascular diseases and respiratory issues, vector bone diseases, and the other emergency of new diseases as well. A particular concern is how natural hazards, climate crisis, and anthropogenic pollution exacerbate such risk and morbidity. Evidence suggests that many rural disadvantaged communities in Puerto Rico have had no access for potable water, electricity, or healthcare facilities for as long as 15 years. Water management is an important issue on the climate change scenario due to the growing concern of water scarcity and frequent drought. Due to climate, new climate as scenarios in Puerto Rico, we are experiencing more frequent droughts at normally dry weather for an extended period of time, causing a water imbalance and frequently resulting in water shortage. On August 2015, the Department of Agriculture declared drought disaster in Puerto Rico. And since then, all subsequent years, we are experiencing slightly dry weather and water imbalance, interacting with aged infrastructure, obsolete reservoirs full of sediments, unable to capture and storage water, and with at least 40% of water leaks in our pipelines. On September 2017, in the Caribbean territories, the U.S. Caribbean territories and the Caribbean islands, all the Caribbean islands as well, um, suffered one of the most catastrophic hurricane season in recent history. Monies of these affected territories experienced major disruption in essential services, such as portable water, electric power, and telecommunications, but also many multiple and many and multiple environmental health issues, such as water sanitation, contaminant exposure, vector-borne disease, food hygiene, and exposure to mold. Hurricane Maria was also responsible for excess mortality in Puerto Rico. Both examples, drought and powerful hurricanes, are interacting with the institutional and environmental context in the island, but also the social determinants of health. For example, urban planning and land use strategies are considered one of the most effective and successful instruments to avoid weather and climate disaster. However, limiting development in high-risk locations often results in a significant political opposition, especially in coastal areas in the tropical regions. The lack of law enforcement for urban planning and land use allowed and promote to build residential and commercial units in high-risk locations. About 50% of the population is located in coastal areas, living in flood-prone areas, and 50% of these coastal communities are living below the poverty level. After many decades of public debts, selling bonds, making bad financial political decisions, the government of Puerto Rico declared bankruptcy on spring 2017, impacting all essential services, such as education, energy, and water. Just a couple of months before the one of the most catastrophic hurricane season that we have suffered in recent history. Bankruptcy 
of course, because of precarious and dire financial situation long before hurricane struck the island and is now limiting our capacity to prepare, respond, and recover. Accordingly to the fourth national climate assessment for the Caribbean region, high level of exposure and sensitivity to risk in the US Caribbean region are compounded by a low level of adaptive capacity due in part to the high cost of mitigation and adaptation measures relatively to the region gross domestic product. This is an important component. Mismanagement of public funds has led us to a substantial lack of maintaining the existing age essential infrastructure, such as water and energy, causing frequent interruptions in the continuity of operations and life on current events. Energy interruptions occur weekly since Hurricane Maria in different parts of the island, leaving thousands of residents, elderly, people with pre existing health conditions and disabilities without electricity, and the situation is getting worse. Nowadays, Massive blackouts are most likely to occur during warm season in Puerto Rico. In September 2021, um, 800,000 households were left without electricity. In warm, humid tropical environments, air conditioning is used to cool indoors environments. As air temperature increase rapidly over the islands and extreme temperatures occur more frequent due to climate change, the consequential increase in cooling and electricity demands occurs. However, Energy demand in Puerto Rico began to decrease in 2005 due to various socioeconomic factors, such as migration, loss of population, loss of commerce, and industries. With recently extreme heat episodes, heat index reached in Puerto Rico uh, 110 and 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Energy demands increase, and the Puerto Rico Energy Authority doesn't have the capacity to satisfy energy demands, causing selective energy shortage to avoid energy collapse. Given this situation, under normal conditions, the, our energy authority is using emergency power generators trying to satisfy the energy demand in the island. On top of that, on September 2020-21, the, the government of Puerto Rico declared a state of emergency over power grid's critical conditions. Evidence is proving that the energy system in Puerto Rico is obsolete and not only vulnerable to powerful hurricanes, but today it's also vulnerable to extreme heat episodes, unable to provide essential services when it's more needed by the population and even under normal circumstances. In this context, extreme events, coupled with the long history of marginalization, access of climate actions, corruption, bankruptcy, political crisis, and lack of governmental support, catalyze action to advance social transformation in our society, promoting an uprising in community-based organizations that have pursued sustainable and resilient development. Self-organizations enhance community social ecological resilience to disasters and climate crisis. This in turn has implications for sustainability, public health, and risk reductions to higher level of community cohesiveness, social capitals, and other factors. Multiple communities in Puerto Rico are developing adaptive resilience as a result of social learning process triggered by external and internal forces like the ones I already mentioned. In some instances, adaptive resilience demonstrates transformability or the ability to perceive the post-disaster recovery and reconstruction process as an opportunity to bounce forward as instead of passing backward as the community was before the disaster. So hundreds of initiatives were born after the hurricane season of 2017, empowering communities to build sustainable and resilient futures. Most of these initiatives draw from the principle of human-centered design. Human-centered design is a problem-solving approach that starts with the people impacted the most by the problem to be solved. And they are um, working directly with the communities and the neighborhoods that were impacted by Hurricane Maria. We have been working with many community-based organizations to co-design long-term sustainable solutions and resources to the community members with a structured problem-solving participatory process culminating in a sustainable action plans. Most of these priorities are now being implemented. As an example, COSAO is a community-based organization in the municipality of Futual, which is an agricultural region representing 7,000 people with one of the highest rates of unemployment, early communities, lack of opportunities, a lot of young adults migrating to the city, and this organization is collaborating with multiple universities um, and, and with support from other foundations and a few state and federal agencies, leading such economic development and social transformation in rural communities of Puerto Rico, promoting public health, providing healthcare access and agro-tourism initiatives. Today, they're running the first health clinic administered by the community-based organization, providing services to underserved communities. The agro-tourism initiative is promoting socioeconomic development with farmers and diversifying employment opportunities by including a new economy. 
tourism in the region. Um, on November 20, 2021, the community is holding the first agrotourism fair in that region in the last 30 years, so you can imagine. We strongly believe that communities in Puerto Rico have the potential to improve adaptation and mitigation actions by fostering a stronger collaboration with initiatives on climate change and disaster reductions. So we believe that the next years are critical to ensure that these efforts are inclusive of alternative, transformative vision and perspective, and most importantly, of the needs of the people and ecosystem that will be mostly uh, most vulnerable to future extreme events. Thank you so much. Dr. Mendez Lazaro, that was truly inspiring and enlightening story. Um, understanding the challenges of island communities and territories is essential if we're going to achieve whole community resilience. Uh, we truly appreciate you for telling your story. Um, thank you. Uh, at this time, we're going to take a short five minute break to set up our panel discussion. We're going to begin promptly just about uh, 1233. So thank you.
Kevin Bush, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Grant Programs with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Rhonda Hag, Chief Resilience Officer, Monroe County, Florida. Eric Letvin, Deputy Assistant Administrator, Mitigation Directorate with FEMA. And Marissa Ramirez, Senior Community Climate Strategy Manager, People and Communities Program with the Natural Resources Defense Council. And now I'll turn it over to our moderator for this discussion, Dr. A.R. Siders, Assistant Professor with the University of Delaware's Disaster Research Center. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you, Bradley, to Sam, Monique, Ashley, everyone at the Community Engagement and Risk Resilience team for setting this up. Uh, thank you to the panelists for joining for this conversation. I'd like to kick this off with a, an easy question, which is about terminology, all right? Manage retreat. Uh, some people hate the phrase. They hate the manage part or they hate the retreat part. Take your pick. So what terminology do you use in your work and why? And why does the phrasing matter? Why does it matter what we call this? Who wants to kick us off? I'll jump in. So go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Rhonda. Okay. Sorry. Sure, go this ahead. Is Rhonda. And for those who don't, you know, in Monroe County, it's also known as the fabulous Florida Keys um, in uh, the south end of uh, Florida, where, of course, Key West, Key Largo, Marathon Island, Rhonda, and all those other wonderful communities reside. So I will say manage retreat is for local communities, it's a very scary term. It, um, it's, it's, it may be activities behind the scenes that are going on that are part of that, um, that are a part of that um, program, but the actual words manage retreat is very difficult for lo any local community that I've dealt with to go out there in public and talk about. It, um, it sounds like you're giving up that you're perhaps, you know, that you're not working with the local community in ways to that you can stay fortified and stay in your hometown as long as you can. Um, it sounds like it might not be voluntary. And so I'm totally in favor of trying to find a new terminology for that, for those type of activities. I think that's, that's great. I, I wanna hear from everyone else. I just wanna reflect on what you said about it being scary. I wonder if it's the, the idea of moving that's scary or if it really is the language, right? If we called it, anything else, would it still be scary to people? Or is it really something about the word retreat that makes it scary? Well, for us here in the Keys, you know, we're an island community and we're very small islands. And um, perhaps in other areas, when you talk about retreat, there are inland areas where you can go to, but in the Florida Keys, there are no inland areas. We're a mile wide or two miles wide. Um, so when you talk retreat, retreat means you're moving out of the Keys. There is there aren't really places to relocate within the island community because it's all, um, you know, at at sea level. So maybe perhaps here it's different, but um, it's it's a very strong term here, and we try to stay away from it. I think that makes sense. Yeah, uh, Kevin, I think you looked like you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate the question because I do think terms matter. Um, you know, and for for us, uh, when we talk about uh, whether it's managed retreat or climate mig migration really at its core, we're talking about a process by which a community uh, moves residential, commercial, public structures from areas of high, uh, high risk and to areas of lower risk. Um, and you know, that method can be done in a, in a way that is um, equitable uh, or not, right? And so uh, I think climate migration is, is, a, is really, should be a, a community-led voluntary effort and community-led Climate migration ultimately is a participatory whole community risk reduction process to develop and execute uh, a relocation strategy. Um, sometimes these processes include buyouts of residential and commercial property as part of a broader strategy. So I know Gaze Mills and Soldiers Grove are both examples of, of relocation that employed buyouts as part of a broader community-led effort. Um, you know, and I think that that community-led participatory process, uh, you know, the importance of it really can't be understated because um, when these things are done in a, in a haphazard way that can result in outcomes we, we don't want. Um, also, when we, when we don't uh, talk about it and address these issues, another thing we want to avoid is, is climate gentrification, another term that I know often gets thrown around in, in these contexts. And you know where we've seen this across the country is is really 
um, when natural disasters and, and other impacts like climate change, uh, sea level rise, erosion, push more affluent residents away from a hazard area and into lower income inland communities that reside on higher ground. I know there's been studies of, of where this is, has actually um, been documented occurring in areas uh, as well. And so, you know, I think terminology is important because the reality is uh, the risks are there and we have to make really tough decisions and guide investments. And, and that needs to be done in a way that is equitable and um, really reflects the, the views of the whole community. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I do think language really matters. Uh, and, you know, typically um, when I think of managed retreat, I do think of it as having a, an intention around it. Um, but both, you know, Rhonda and Kevin, you mentioned kind of um, what does that mean to the community? That sort of fear that it may be involuntary is real. Um, the fear that it may not be community driven is real. Um, but there's also at the same time climate migration or relocation or displacement or gentrification movement that happens where uh, people that want to move cannot and do not have the resources to do that or people that want to stay in place cannot and do not have the resources to to do that so i think with the language that we use we have to be clear and define it and and really understand what comes behind it I think we've seen this around uh, from the community development perspective, the term resiliency uh, has been discussed a lot in relationship to larger climate adaptation measures in addition to managed retreat uh, and some of these sort of problematic ways that uh, it's happened um, and, and communities uh, that I've worked with have actually used the term toxic resiliency to refer to a type of resiliency where there's an expectation that communities, some communities are expected to uh, continue to um, weather some of the impacts and not receive the proper investment in order to be able to adapt in place or to uh, move uh, effectively where they need to move and have the resources to do so. Well, and, and speaking of the, so we're gonna discuss the equity implications because that's a huge issue in manager treat and how we think about that. Uh, Eric, I'm going to put you on the spot in terms of thinking about how do we get resources to communities who need it the most, right? And, and this is a constant challenge in federal programs of how do you get resources to local governments who maybe don't have the capacity to apply for them, but you still need to get them there. What, how are you working to try to address that? How do you uh, address those challenges? Well, it, it's, a, it's a great question. I think the foundation for this, I agree with Kevin 100%, it has to be a community-driven uh, process. And I think the foundation for all of this is the uh, planning process, whether it be hazard mitigation plans or land use plans, it has to be community driven. Um, if you look at what was announced just yesterday by the White House, the revised climate.gov website, I mean, I think one of the things that we can do at the federal level is to provide those decision support tools to support the communities who do decide that they um, are interested in this. And, and we've been, uh, at FEMA, we've been funding community relocation since the start of our grant programs in 1993, well over 25 communities we have assisted in relocating. So we've been doing this um, for a long time. I think the question is, if you look at what's in the National Climate Assessment and what the scientists tell us is what's gonna happen in this country, um, we're gonna need more of this. And so how do we scale this up? How do we provide communities with the right tools that they need to take whatever actions they decide to take and how do we support them through the planning process and, and obviously through our, our grants. I think that's a great point on the need to scale up. And, and I'd love to hear from any of the panelists on, uh, you know, in terms of scaling up to meet the challenges of climate change, right now, most of the management treat, we're gonna hear from Dennis Knobloch and the community engagement of Valmeyer, Illinois later on in this session, but most of the buyouts and relocations that are happening are at an individual level. So, is it, you know, should we be trying to scale up buyouts and do larger buyouts? Should we be switching to a different type of manager treat? And if so, how do we need to change the structure of our, you know, funding and engagement to think about that? Um, how, are, how are you all thinking about those types of engagements? Scaling up the challenge. Yeah, Kevin. Well, and I, I think, you know, building off 
uh, your first question and Eric's answer as well to the reality is that there are a lot of different resources at the federal level and the state and local level that can be applied to uh, facilitate a, a community led climate migration process. Um, but, you know, it takes that community planning process to both, uh, you know, have a concerted effort at the local level, but also to tie together those funds. So, you know, you, you mentioned um, who you're going to hear from next. That project was actually fu funded uh, in part through HUD funding years ago. Uh, and so, you know, our relationship with at HUD, climate migration and buyouts, falls into two primary areas, um, facilitating the relocation of of, of housing that's currently subsidized by HUD. So, you know, low income, multifamily housing, et cetera. And then also providing funds to state and local and tribal governments for relocation. Um, we've provided technical assistance as well as communities engage in that community led process because we do, we do want to support um, that effort. Um, and, you know, to get into the specifics, um, with FEMA, we're one of two agencies who provide a substantial amount of funding that can be used to develop a buyout or relocation program. Um, you know, that includes the Community Development Block Grant, the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery, um, and as well, even our home investment partnership funds could be used to provide home purchase or rehab financing assistance to eligible homeowners and new homeowners. Um, and, you know, We've in the past taken a more comprehensive effort through things like the National Disaster Resilience Competition and, and Rebuild by Design. Um, the key thing that unites the, the HUD aspect of it is um, the, with a particular focus on low and, and moderate income folks. And I think, and I know we'll get into this later in discussion, but that focus is particularly important because, you know, Oftentimes, um, there are bad historical reasons for how folks ended up in, in high risk areas in the first place, right? You know, um, the, the land is less expensive for a reason. Um, and that, that reason, in many cases, has been because it, it floods all the time. And so, you know, we do, I think, have a responsibility at, at all levels of government to address that past inequity by focusing on um, how to either move low and moderate income folks from harm's way or better mitigate the risk uh, where they are if they choose to stay. So that's a really important question. And Marissa, I'm, I'm sure you have thoughts on this. So how do we address historic historical injustices, right? Redlining, segregation, disinvestment, all kinds of problems that communities have faced. Uh, how, can we, how can we start to even try to address those issues? Do you have thoughts? Yeah, it's a great question. And ultimately, our policies around climate and housing are kind of at that convergence of the histories of inequity uh, in our systems of policy. And so, you know, I think that, Kevin, you started to kind of get there. Um, but I think, you know, historically, traditionally, a lot of uh, managed retreat and a lot of policies have uh, yet to sort of reach the scale in terms of accounting for that historic and structural conditions that can often reproduce inequity um, while sort of attend, intending to redress the risk and vulnerability. I mean, ultimately, um, I think now as a practice, we're really moving into thinking about protecting people over, you know, simply property and profit, um, but continuing to sort of put people first and considering that history um, considering, you know, we've seen those flood maps now that really sort of overlay the uh, where flooding is most um, occurring with the redlining maps. Um, and so how can we, you know, critically and proactively and purposefully enable uh, policymakers and, and community members to participate in um, uh, processes and kind of have a holistic strategy, one that, you know, buyouts may be part of, um, uh, but, you know, also ensuring that others can receive the investments to adapt in place if that's where they, they need. Um, and so I think, you know, there's um, really an opportunity for, for strategic partnerships across, you know, like agencies are starting to do now at the federal level, but also locally really supporting housing and community partnerships, community development partners to come together uh, and really address what's happening locally. Um, and, you know, one example that, um, that is, comes to mind, it's actually not really considered part of managed retreat examples, but our partners 
in Los Angeles have been bringing together um, open space practitioners and housing practitioners to really make sure that resiliency investments uh, are intentionally paired with affordable housing. Uh, and they're really thinking, I think, from an integrated perspective. Um, uh, uh, the, the La Rosa group, which is the, the LA Regional Open Space Collaborative, um, this has been one concept to bring folks together. Um, and I think you know some of these partnerships we don't really think of as strategies, but they most certainly are part of the toolkit and really acknowledge um, you know representing people that are um, being directly impacted. Those partnerships seem really, really critical. Uh, and Rhonda, I want to ask your perspective, right? Working at more of a local level, particularly, uh, you can ignore Eric and Kevin for a minute. I'll, go, I'll let them defend their agencies in a second. But how is it work? How is it going partnering with federal agencies or other government agencies? Like, is that a good experience or, or what, what challenges are you encountering? It's an interesting experience. So mm -hmm. That's a um, wonderful Midwestern euphemism for really <laughs> so, big problems. Yeah. <laughs> three years ago, um, I'll just give you an example of what happened. You know, Army Corps came to town and wanted to do a Keys Coastal Storm Risk um, study to help the Keys be more resilient to um, coastal storms and, and hopefully sea level rise. And they went through, they have these series of models that they go through and they looked at everything to determine, you know, what projects would be um, helpful to make us more resilient. Of course, us being an island community, you would expect that homes might be one of them, um, and it was. And in the early stages of their modeling, they presented, they, you know, they went through there and looked at all the places that were um, subject to sea level rise and coastal storm, and there's a lot of them. And they come up with this list of almost 9,000 homes um, that they put on this list for um, a potential acquisition list. Well, that all in all was scary enough in itself um, but what happened was the Corps has this policy that says any of its acquisitions are mandatory. And that really scared people. And we heard from a lot of community members and leaders and business leaders that, that absolutely no um, interest in anything that was mandatory. And so it took us, it took you know several more months. We did put in a request to have that be optional because I thought it would be a much more um, program that could be, that would be useful if it was optional, if people, you know, had their homes hurt by uh, hurricanes or whatever, um, then they would have a, at least a buyer. But um, they withdrew their request before we got much further because as they ran their cost models, they said, oh, it actually turns out that it was more cost effective to provide funds to elevate these homes instead of buying them up just because the cost per home down here is so expensive. But since so that was that experience, and then just a little short time later, you know, we do we were the recipient of a grant from HUD through HUD, the Community Development Block Grant Funds um, for $15 million, a small start for voluntary home buyouts for homes that were hit by Hurricane Irma or, or other ones. And that program is just kicking off and we received no community um, disenchantment with that. So that's that whole difference. It's voluntary versus mandatory. When you say mandatory, people think you're taking your homes away from them. They don't want to. So that's going to be a really important part of moving forward with this is how to make it voluntary and effective. And uh, Eric, to, uh, FEMA's, uh, FEMA's bio programs are voluntary. Uh, how does FEMA coordinate with HUD, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, other government agents? Like, how does that work trying to coordinate those? Or what challenges are you facing trying to coordinate with other agencies who are involved in, in retreat and uh, resiliency? Yeah, so it, it, it's a great question. And um, I think where we do the best job working together, um, I'd love to hear Kevin's thoughts on this, but the core uh, is really in the post-disaster environment where, where we set up, FEMA sets up a joint field office and we have representatives from all the federal agencies together. Um, because obviously uh, the best example I think right now is in Puerto Rico where um, all of our funds are being used. When there's a large disaster supplemental, the core gets funding, NOAA gets funding, HUD gets funding, FEMA gets funding. And the community just wants to, to, to focus on an outcome. And they want us to work together and figure out how our programs can be used. And quite often, um, uh, you know, HUD's uh, CDBG, Kevin's uh, funding is used as a, um, um, a cost match for a lot of our mitigation funds. So um, through a process called the Unified Federal Review, um, that helps us come, come together to, to handle the environmental requirements and work together as a federal team to ensure that we are delivering our programs in a way that makes sense for, for communities. So uh, um, 
Could we do a better job? Certainly. I think uh, in the pre-disaster environment where um, you know, funds are, um, are, are different, um, I think we certainly could do a better job uh, coordinating to help, help. We hear all the time from communities, um, it's, it's difficult trying to navigate when funds are available from one agency and another agency, and how do we navigate all of that? And we don't have money to hire a consultant. So we heard a lot of that when we put together our Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities grant program. And one of the big things that we did there was focus money on partnering, focus money on capacity building to allow for those kinds of things to occur, allow for communities to um, you know, apply for a grant, for funds, for a project that they needed some additional work on um, to, help, to help partner and work with other agencies and navigate that process. So I think we do a, a very good job in the post-disaster environment. I think we, we always could do a better job in the pre-disaster environment. Kevin, do you have thoughts on this too? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I would, I would love to see. Um, so, well, backing up, the the perspective that I'm bringing is is having worked at the federal, state, and local level, and trying trying to do this in in each of those places. And it's not easy, certainly. But um, you know, I would love to see local communities that try to knit together those funds um, with local funds, honestly. Uh, and I'd love to to support them to to do that. You know, when we um, HUD maybe five or six years ago, uh, amended its uh, consolidated planning requirements. So the, the plan that you need to do every five years to get access to your regular CDBG, not the disaster funding, but the regular CDBG. And mm -hmm. we, we added in a consultation requirement um, with, with Eric's folks, with the local emergency managers. And we said, go talk to them and identify how climate change will impact your low and moderate income populations, the folks that the HUD funding serves. And consider, you know, using your funds to address that risk. And, you know, it, just, it was a small push in, in one that we're building technical assistance resources around. We have a, a climate resilience toolkit that's out. We're building implementation models. One of them will probably be on this subject. Um, and, you know, it is difficult though, because when you get down to the local level, right, um, you know, the folks that receive funding from HUD, are, you know, often work for like a housing and community development department. The folks that receive funding from FEMA work for an emergency management agency. Uh, let's add DOT into the mix and you've got a totally another agency. And I think that the challenge for communities is coming in with that community led vision again, and then knitting all of those funds together. Because um, ultimately, you know, the amount of resources we have, uh, is not at the level to scale to meet the problem, right? Uh, you know, you can look at um, the National Climate Assessment, which Eric mentioned. You can look at reports recently from the IPCC and know that this is something uh, uh, that is unfortunately a growth industry that we're going to have to to deal with more and more. And um, where the creativity will happen and, and has been happening on climate action is at the local level, because um, they're the folks that are are hearing from their communities um, that are figuring out what resources they have available to address the problem and how they can knit them together. I think it's interesting, you know, you're reflecting on the different roles of government, right? It sounds like uh, the role of HUD in some ways is to provide this funding and provide capacity if it can. But a lot of those really hard decisions are gonna come down to the local level. And, and Rhonda, I know you've had to face some really hard decisions about, I think you mentioned like, which roads do you elevate and which ones do you not? How do you go about thinking about those decisions? like? Which roads do you not elevate? Well, so we just wrapping up a two year study where we did exactly that. We took our look at all of the roads that the county maintains and see which ones are gonna be subject to sea level rise inundation in the next 25 years. And as it turned out, half of them are. So that's 150 miles out of 300. And that's just an unincorporated Monroe. We're working with the municipalities to catch them up. And so the price tag for that 150 miles is 1.8 billion to raise the roads, just those roads to the year 2045. Now we're not a populous county, we're a county of 75,000 residents. That's a lot of money. And so as we're wrapping up this study and going out and talking to our elected officials in our community, it's like, okay, how do we pay for this? Um, because we aren't expecting, to, although we'd love it, to get all federal and state funding to pay for $1.8 billion of road elevation so that we could all stay here longer. Um, it's not going to happen. And so we have to figure out 
what that combination is. How do we, how do we fund it? And it's been interesting because we've heard the whole gamut. I, I, I would have thought everyone would say, yes, you know, we'll be willing to put in our share to help, you know, pay for the roads elevation and for the, to keep the pumps running, you know, long-term, it's gonna, gonna be an operations and maintenance piece, but it hasn't been, it's been all over the board. We've had residents, you know, and maybe because it's so many second and third homeowners down here, it's not everybody is first homeowners. It's, it's a big mix. Um, we have second and third homeowners and a lot of um, vacation rentals and they're not all willing to um, put in their own money to help road elevations. It's, it's a mixed bag and, you know, so as we move forward, that's really going to be the determining factor yeah, about how much of that 1.8 billion in roads elevation we're going to be able to implement. It's going to be um, on the community and how much they're willing to contribute. Um, and because we realize we're going to get, lim you know, hopefully we get some help from the state and federal government, but it's going to be um, very telling. And probably that more than anything is going to determine how resilient the Florida Keys will be in the future. It's going to be how much the community themselves are willing to contribute. Well, in 2045, that's not, uh, I mean, I started thinking in terms of home mortgages, that's not even a whole mortgage, right? That's not a 30 year mortgage payoff. That's, that's relatively quick to be thinking about, okay, even if we adapt, thinking that there might be another billion dollar price tag in 2045 that you need again. Uh, and I can imagine Eric and Kevin, you're both thinking about your budgets and thinking, no, we couldn't do a billion dollars in every single community around the United States who might be facing that same challenge, right? Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a massive the secondary home versus primary homeowners is a really interesting question. Uh, and I'm sure that plays into how you're thinking about like property taxes or revenues too. Um, you know, Marissa, have you seen this with the secondary homes and the primary homes? And is this primarily a coastal issue? Is it also a riverine? You know, do you see those same patterns of the riverine communities or, or is there a big difference there that you're seeing? Yeah, it's a great question. First, I was just gonna respond to, you know, we're all seeing, I think, even from the NGO perspective, a need for this integrated, this coordinated, this funding approach from all uh, sector, you know, all sectors, all agencies, and all forms of government. And I think that that's a role that you know the NGOs have been uh, playing to some extent and trying to uh, support um, local partners, local capacities, and, and innovative ideas, uh, you know, nationally and locally to kind of coordinate program opportunities resources, um, ensure that uh, community visions and criteria make it into kind of local development plans, um, providing that pre-application support. You know, I think ultimately that's something that could really be integrated into uh, city planning, um, but, you know, at least in terms of piloting, that I think is a role that um, we've been playing um, in terms of, you know, providing that coordination, elevating up you know, what um, community needs are and then bringing back resources back into communities. Um, so, you know, and like you said, local development isn't dictated by federal statute, right? So um, how are cities able to uh, really invest in that local participation and planning process to consider, you know, both from kind of a retreat and a sort of receiving communities perspective, I think it's really important. Um, and then just to get to your question on uh, coastal communities versus uh, riverine. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm interested in really also from an equity perspective, thinking about inland areas in addition, and, you know, if someone has something specific to say about riverine um, flooding, I think really jump in, but, uh, you know, coastal communities are often really top of mind. Uh, we're familiar with uh, the impacts, we're familiar with Miami and South Florida, the climate gentrification, the ways climate migration has sort of negatively impacted historic communities in South Florida with affluent people moving away from the coast and putting pressure on low income areas. But I think, you know, there's also this growing recognition that, um, you know, beyond coastal communities, in fact, um, you know, we, we think of even most buyouts happen in non-coastal areas. Um, so in addition to sort of riverine, I think also urban and inland flooding um, really underscore a lot of those inequities that are inherent both in terms of those climate impacts and in terms of management. Um, you know, and I said this up front, but ultimately buyouts are at this intersection of housing and disasters. So they underscore the inequities in both systems. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that this sometimes gets lost in the conversation that it's really mainly about an issue of wealthy people in their second homes in their, or in their third homes. Um, I think there's also, you know, a related issue of when people move, how are you, 
managing uh, stormwater and there's inequities around that. Um, and so you can think about even um, when people move away and the land is left vacant um, or in a receiving community, uh, often more affluent areas will kind of more likely get amenities related to uh, parks or open space that better address those long-term issues. Um, and so, you know, when we think of the investment, some of the initial investments that we make, uh, whether it's CDBG or other loan funds or flood insurance that cover, you know, some of the initial um, buyouts or initial infrastructure investments, there's also the sort of long-term uh, thinking that I think a lot of communities are starting to grapple with especially in these inland areas around stormwater flood management. Um, you know, how are we able to sort of consider those, um, both the impacts to inland uh, flooding, but also in relation to, ma to manage retreat. And I think there's kind of this opportunity to think about um, ways to sort of in have an investment strategy around green infrastructure that provides opportunities for bringing amenities to, um, areas that are typically historically less invested um, and, uh, and really even providing those opportunities for local hiring uh, and, and long-term long jobs that um, are sustained even after that initial investment. So I think there's a lot of issues that you know, are really beyond sort of what we think of when we first think of coastal communities that come to mind. Um, and of course, you know, coastal communities are, like I said, not just wealthy, People, right? It's it's who are we really um, talking about that's being impacted, um, and uh, and and how are we able to kind of um, support the needs of that specific community? I want to come back to the the integration piece you've been talking about with like development and new housing and where that's being built. Uh, but first, I want to I want to pick on this like income, like the expense of the properties that are being bought out. Uh, and I'm really curious how you all think about this because I think a lot of there's a lot of division here, right? Buyouts occurring in lower income areas or in wealthier areas, right? And what are the equity implications of both of those? Because on the one hand, you want to offer resources to lower income communities, uh, and and sometimes like price caps or the fact that you're looking at really expensive coastal properties makes it kind of infeasible to purchase coastal properties. On the other hand, if we purchase all the low-income housing and just leave the wealthy houses on the beach or on, you know, in these urban areas or these floodplain areas, then that's not fair either. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, any of you, but Kevin, maybe your organization focuses most on low and moderate income homeowners. How do you think about the equity implications of supporting buyouts in low-income areas? And is that, you know, is that helping people or is that displacement? Great question. I mean, so our funds, you're exactly right, are um, you know, HUD's kind of unifying theme, if you will, is low and moderate income folks. So CDBG, uh, DR, you know, there's flexibility built in for states and locals to uh, address some of these more comprehensive things, but it still has to, 70% 70, 70 of the funds still have to primarily benefit low and moderate income individuals. So there is that focus. Uh, in my annual programs like HOME, for example, um, the home investment partnerships has uh, statutory, you know, in, income limits and rent limits and, and all that. So, um, you know, my funds aren't aren't unified even by risk reduction. Technically, they're they're unified by the desire to help uh, improve the lives of low and moderate income folks. But they're also not exclusively buyout funds, right? So there's 26 eligible uses in CDBG. There's actually even more in CDBG DR because we allow for housing construction as well. Um, and I think you've seen communities, you know, leverage that flexibility, right? So um, Minot, North Dakota uh, had a $74 million grant from us um, and launched in, through part of that a resilient home buyer program to help eligible buyers whose homes were destroyed or significantly damaged in 2011. Um, and through that, they've, they've already helped, I think, 50 LMI homeowners move to, to areas um, of lower risk and, and higher opportunity as well. So I think, you know, we have other grantees that have used the funds to make infrastructure upgrades, right? And, and ultimately, it comes down to what that community decides is, is in their best interest. So um, the funds are flexible. They can be structured to take an infrastructure approach that can be structured to avoid the high risk areas in the first place. Uh, and then if you're reconstructing housing, we, we include actually some 
pretty aggressive um, uh, floodplain re uh, risk reduction standards already into that. So if you do decide to stay and 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 rebuild, you're going to have to rebuild at a higher uh, level of risk mitigation. Yeah, um, Eric, I want to I want to put you on the spot on this one. Uh, FEMA has this you know, benefit cost benefit cost analysis requirement. Everything needs to be cost effective. Good intentions, right? Of course. And there's a, a 2013 memo that says buyouts of homes that are 276,000 or under and meet some other conditions to have cost effective. Uh, you know, I've seen some analyses suggest that that, uh, that tends to make buyouts occur in homes under that value. Is that intentional? Uh, is there, you know, a concern about that, about, you know, not purchasing more expensive homes, primarily funding the purchase of lower value homes? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, wow, there's a lot there. So um, we created this called pre-calculated benefits. So we created those based on data that we've been funding acquisitions for the last uh, 28 years. And we created those pre-calculated benefits to essentially make it easier for communities where they didn't have to go and, and do a benefit cost ratio. So it was really um, to make it easier to, uh, to lower the, the barrier of entry for our grant programs. Um, I mean, quite often, you look at our flood mitigation assistance program, which is directed by Congress to, to uh, elevating or acquiring um, repetitive loss structures. I mean, we have data that shows that a lot of the, um, the, the, the folks that have repetitive losses in their homes are of lower income. Um, but we also know that a lot of communities have very low flood, pen flood insurance penetration rates, 10, 20 percent, you know, or lower. So, I mean, really, I, I think our focus should be on ending disaster suffering and how do we, um, you know, we home, uh, what is the equity in allowing a, a, a family to, to, to be in a house that's flooded over and over? So, um, I mean, our programs are designed to, for those communities that want it, again, it's voluntary. How do we end disaster suffering and um, homes that are getting wet over and over again, that, 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 that homeowner is suffering, you know, losses often uninsured. Um, but you raised an excellent question. I think one of the things, and Marissa is exactly right on this, the more and more I um, learn about this, I think um, uh, you know, a lot of our mitigation grant programs are tied to affordable housing. So um, if people have nowhere to move to, um, if, you know, are, we, are we simply shuffling people around the floodplain when we're buying out these properties? Um, I think what we really need is, a, and Kevin and Marissa, jump in, please. I mean, what we really need is affordable housing in a safe location where people can relocate to. Um, and I think that way we end disaster, su a lot of the suffering, and we really address the uh, equity issue. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a great point. And ultimately, how are, you know, I know uh, all of the agencies now release their climate adaptation plans for comment. And there was a lot, you know, for instance, around you know, evaluating risks and opportunities here and uh, really looking at environmental justice data and building, you know, interagency collaboration. But I think, you know, um, in thinking about some of the money that may be on the table with reconciliation and um, with uh, community restoration and revitalization fund, you know, how are we thinking about, um, you know, affordable housing and all different types types of models in these areas, um, you know, both addressing kind of that disaster response, but also that long-term equity. Um, and so, you know, I think this is something that, again, federal government can certainly incentivize and then locally really offering a range of community development strategies that look at, that include, um, you know, anti-displacement strategies that include addressing gentrification as well as, of course, you know, civic infrastructure so that there is a landing place to move. And what are the policies around that? Um, I think that that's, you know, a conversation that, you know, we're starting to have. Um, but I think, you know, Eric, to your point, historically has really focused on sort of that disaster response piece. Um, and so, you know, what are the social resources, education, employment, edu um, and, and other, you know, healthcare um, in, in areas to kind of have that comprehensive strategy how, and how are we looking at things like, um, uh, you know, shared equity home ownership models that offer um, additional opportunities for home ownership and that long-term affordability. Um, you know, I think that's all part of the strategy that I think is, you know, just starting to be discussed now that's really tied to this conversation around managed retreat. 
um, historically really focused on kind of that disaster uh, component. Kevin, yeah, please jump in. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the non-disaster side of it too. Um, and, you know, we were talking earlier uh, about funding and there was a, a very poignant example um, <laughs> on, the, on the needs there. You know, and, and one thing that, you know, I was encouraged by was uh, HUD in, in our FY22 budget, uh, we recognize this gap, particularly for existing affordable housing and the need to do a lot on, in the retrofit space, right? It's not just about housing that's been damaged already or housing that doesn't exist yet. Um, what do we do about the housing stock that exists currently and is at risk? So, you know, the president's budget asked for 800 million across uh, a number of programs, including our multifamily assisted, our public housing programs to do a suite of green and resilient retrofits. Um, and then in addition, you know, as you mentioned, Marissa and Build Back Better, um, there, the scale is even greater, right? Recognizing that there's both a housing crisis and a climate crisis. And so, you know, the, the, the housing as infrastructure um, component, you know, I think is, or argument is, is made pretty clearly made in the, in the event of a disaster when there is no housing. Um, and that's why we need, you know, to, to uh, invest on the front end. Uh, and I'm encouraged by the FY22 ask for the, the retrofit, but then also, you know, if, if the president's request in Build Back Better, really connecting the dots between housing and climate. Yeah, I'm, I'm always struck, uh, the government accountability report, Eric, I don't mean to put FEMA on the hot seat here, but just there was a report last year that came out and showed that FEMA had helped uh, mitigate risk of 57,000 repetitive flood loss houses. But over the same time period, an additional 64,000 homes had been added to the repetitive, like had become repetitive flood loss properties. And so it suggested, I think, like that, uh, that there's this bigger issue, right? You can go in and you can buy out homes or help them, but at the same time, there has to be this integration of how do you prevent homes or how do you help address risk in other ways? Kevin, to your point on how do you retrofit these homes and deal with this outside of the post-disaster context, because it's so limited. Um, and Eric, happy to hear your thoughts there. Otherwise, Rhonda, I'm gonna ask you about how you know, how you see in Monroe County, the emergency and housing officials working together, or, you know, do you see that, I guess, happening? But Eric, I'd, I'd give you a chance to comment on that report first, if you wanted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's a great point. I mean, we need to understand where land use authority lies. It lies at the local level. The building permits are issued at the local level. Um, those decisions about where to build and, and how to build um, are done by local governments. So as we see uh, climate change and sea level rise. And we see, um, you know, we, we certainly know a large percentage of our country uh, lives near the coastline or lives near water. Um, we're we're, we're going to see, um, we have aging infrastructure uh, in this country. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of homes that were built even before we had flood insurance rate maps in the, in the 70s. So as we see climate change progress and we see a uh, identification in areas near water. Um, I, I'm not surprised that that repetitive loss structure number is increasing and it will continue to increase. Um, what we can do at FEMA is, is to use the funds that Congress uh, appropriates to us in the best way and try to uh, continue to take a chunk of, um, you know, just, 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 just take a chunk out of it year after year after year. And um, you know, it's a it's a very attractive cost match for the in that program or flood mitigation assistance program. But um, again, uh, uh, I, I should point out uh, just yesterday was um, uh, in the White House fact sheet on climate. We um, had a federal register notice um, seeking comment on our minimum standards for building um, in the uh, uh, for the, 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 the national flood insurance program. So you know, I I, I point people there. Um, that is one way to, uh, uh, we're seeking input on how should the, um, you know, building the construction requirements and land use requirements within the uh, special flood hazard area, how should they potentially change? They haven't changed, um, I believe, in 47 years. So uh, we are beginning that process. Oh. Big piece. Now, there's a lot of effort there, and, and I think you're absolutely right. It's an interesting divide between the authority, right, and the funding and, and coming from different sources, how do you create those incentives? Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, Rhonda, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, sort of as our representative of all local governments around the United States, uh, how is how is the integration working in terms of thinking about 
housing development and emergency response? Well, here in the Keys, you know, we've been facing this for many years now, affordable housing crisis. It has been a crisis. It's even worse now. And I look at this pro these programs that we're all discussing here today, you know, especially about managed buyouts, you know, when you it's the homes that are underinsured or by a local server, they're owned by a local worker, whether it's a local sheriff's officer or a teacher or, or a service worker, they're the homes that are getting damaged. It's not the oceanfront coastal homes. They're gonna be rebuilt no matter what. Yeah. It's the interior homes. And when you lose one of those homes to a buyout or whatever, that's one less house that we have available for a teacher or, you know, or um, a police officer, or a local government worker, a service worker. And so it, it, we're kind of caught here um, especially here, because there is no place to go. If we lose a house, you can't say, okay, we can move five miles away and buy another house here because there isn't, you know, they're occupied or there's just not a new available housing come here. We're under, um, you know, a growth restriction here as to number of houses. So when we use lose units, it hurts. We already, um, you know, unfortunately in the upper keys, you know, it's very, it's expensive everywhere, but in the upper keys, they have to um, bring workers in from Miami-Dade County on the mainland by bus. It's been a lot of them come in by bus. It's an hour ride each way. Um, and so it's already at maximum capacity and, and uh, it's going to be really interesting how to move forward because you can't just buy out the low-income houses or to, you know, we might have to look at ways to make them resilient instead so we can keep our local population here. We need service workers here. We can't just all be vacation rentals. We need local people here to help, um, you know, everybody else live here. And that's going to be, that's probably one of our biggest challenges in the Keys. It always has been, but moving forward even more. This might be a hard question to ask you on a recorded webinar, but, uh, you know, is there a recognition that some communities or some islands may just not be sustainable? It may not be possible to keep them resilient into the future? So we're not to that point yet. Um, okay. So what we're doing is we're using all of the science and engineering available and we're doing our studies in our planning. So what would it take to keep the Florida Keys resilient? And we're coming very close now. We know it's two and a half billion dollars under the Army Corps plan, another 1.82 billion under the Monroe County Roads Elevation Plan and then some other things. So it's gonna take several billion dollars. And what's gonna happen now is this is like I said, this is where the community is gonna come into play. And also, you know, agencies like HUD, because they develop, they put parameters on the funding that we get. And I'll give you an example. Last year, we applied for two pilot road elevation projects. One was in a lower and moderate income area, and one was not. The one that was not was more subject to inundation. The one in the lower level, and the one in the lower and moderate income level was still subject, but not as much. The one in the upper, in the uh, upper keys was already seeing over a foot of water on the roads during the fall king tides. And so we put both applications in. We did thankfully receive a grant for the one in the lower keys, which was a lower and moderate income area. So we're moving forward with that one, but the other one we're not. So that housing area, it's, it's not lower and moderate income area, but it's 150, 160 homes looking at a $25 million road elevation improvement project. How are we gonna fund those type of things? Um, are, or are we not? And uh, I, this is really where local government is gonna struggle everywhere um, because it's going to be a matter of resources and where they're applied and making those tough decisions. So we're not there yet in the keys. I think um, like federal granting requirements and availability of resources and local community, what they want um, is going to really guide those decisions. Those are going to be hard conversations yeah. if, if and when they do happen. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Marissa. And I was just, you know, going to add, I think, to that question of, you know, are some places just cannot be saved? You know, I think, it, you know, it's a really, it is a really hard question. It's a really hard question to answer. Um, you know, and I think this also comes back to that question that you asked at the beginning around language. Um, there was uh, an article that was written recently um, that identified, you know, is a city a vulnerable city, meaning, you know, they're expected to lose population. Uh, is a is a place a receiving area where they re receive people maybe unintentionally, and are there places that are designating themselves wanting to brand themselves as climate havens or climate destinations? Um, and I think you know I think there's a lot of pros and cons to these des these designations. I think one one benefit is it does help us to really identify where these places might be and where you know if there's a receiving community you know how can we allocate resources where you know, typically um, 
there hasn't been a focus there or how can we work with communities to really utilize some of those CDBG funds in areas you know, that are not the disasters as designation area. Um, but I think you know, some of the downside is that you might uh, detract from investment, uh, you know, and not just public investment, but private investment in these areas. Uh, one of the pieces that we've looked at and with some of our um, you know, partner communities is this concept of disinvestment induced displacement. Um, and, you know, it could be an area that is vulnerable. It could be an area that's, you know, simply disinvested for a variety of reasons. Um, and I think, you know, as we're really trying to understand, you know, some of the future impacts and how to best, you know, support people um, and then, you know, make really difficult decisions around allocating resources. Um, you know, I think having more data, I think, is really helpful making that available in terms of, you know, uh, what critical infrastructure in addition to housing is really at risk is is going to help us make some of those more strategic decisions. But I think, you know, at this point, um, you know, Rhonda probably answered it best, right? Because it's really hard to say, you know, we're just going to stop investing in this area. Um, you know, and there may be a need to get to that point in some places where it's, it's actually unsafe to sustain infrastructure without um, the population around it. Um, but until then, I think you really need to be, you know, engaging in conversations thoughtfully, purposefully, um, and really be mindful of what that um, language could really mean. Well, there's interesting examples from um, overseas, right? The United Kingdom just uh, declared that it is disinvesting from a whole town in Wales. Yeah, like they are not going to invest in their coastal infrastructure and they're going to decommission it in 50 years. So they have a they have a timeline where that town will no longer exist. So it'll be interesting to see you know, what lessons we learn from that as well. I'm curious, Marissa, I wanna push you a little bit on this disinvestment issue, because I think this is a big one, right? And we, what lessons have we learned or can we learn from say smart planning, thinking about urban sprawl, right? All these land use and planning tools that have said, hey, to prevent urban sprawl and help achieve environmental goals, we should prioritize investment here and not invest over here. What lessons have we learned from those types of not climate, but you know, the same sort of trying to shift populations that we can apply here or, or are we learning any lessons? Maybe, maybe we're not, I don't know. But I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what, how we're drawing parallels between those. Yeah, and, and it's a great question. And I think, you know, there's a couple of ways to think about it. I think, you know, from that urban planning perspective, you know, there's also, there's, there's physical displacement and there's also the social cultural displacement aspect to it, right? Um, you know, and there could be, uh, climate migration could be really similar in a lot of ways to this economic disinvestment. Um, you know, where folks have had to move uh, because there's a lack of economic opportunities, um, or say, in some cases, if there's a large industry that or company that leaves. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, we're looking at uh, where there's few economic opportunities and people leave, and and or there's disamenities like flooding or pollution, right? And um, and then people uh, are, are worse off by staying. Um, and all, oftentimes what happens is uh, both in climate migration situations and in uh, economic disinvestment, people move and they're worse off. Um, I think there needs to be more uh, data around this, but I think initially sometimes we see people are moving to places where um, you know, there's worse poverty um, or there's worse uh, flooding. Um, and you know, I think that this is um, something that's really difficult. So that's there. There's some similarities there that I think we can look at, um, and 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 even in you know looking at how we've um, we've had to sort of think about uh, even COVID and where people are living, um, and so and especially in thinking about uh, renters and people that don't own own their homes, um, you know, where are they moving? Where are they landing? That has the social infrastructure of where they move. I think these are lessons that we're starting to think about in terms of uh, urban planning. Um, I think we're really trying to look at where can we uh, have all of those amenities, um, housing, uh, economic opportunities, uh, the climate resilient benefits. Um, and, and there's some, I think, strategies that people have been looking around, looking at locally in terms of um, land banking and looking at housing uh, and acquiring homes uh, and land in areas that are resilient. And this could happen even within a, within an area and not just even you know, between regions. Um, and, and then really keeping that long-term affordability. Um, you know, there's some differences too, right? With climate versus economic disinvestment. Um, you know, presumably there could be economic disinvestment in an area that's not climate vulnerable. Um, 
And, you know, you might look at this in, in you know, cases like Detroit or, or other parts of the country where there's, there's enough infrastructure there and there's, there's community there, you know, something else could, another industry could potentially um, come in and there's, you know, a commitment to really recognizing uh, worker contributions, community contributions to an area, um, you know, and I think there might be areas, you know, in the case of climate migration where there isn't that opportunity to sort of return. Um, and then I think, you know, how are we looking holistically at these other sort of destinations uh, to, again, build around that social infrastructure around that? Um, you know, so I think, you know, if we're not thoughtful, there might be sort of, again, these climate winners and climate uh, losers. Um, and, you know, ultimately, when there's disasters that happen, um, the federal government is not going to let, you know, certain cities, I think, uh, fail. Um, but I think we need to be really careful to ensure that, you know, folks that are in frontline communities and in re receiving communities have a level of thoughtful engagement uh, and work with local leaders around kind of that planning and development. And that's, you know, part and parcel to, uh, you know, working with communities, valuing uh, their contributions in terms of comprehensive plans and local plans um, that we know um, from urban planning. I love the idea that we, we can learn some of these lessons here. Uh, Kevin, I, I wanna ask you, uh, maybe, and to the extent you know about this, but you know, HUD has this moving to opportunity program, right? Specifically trying to use movement to help people economically get out of poverty, right? Uh, and so are there lessons being learned within HUD from these type of economic mobility programs to climate mobility programs? You are right that moving to opportunity is not in my wheelhouse, so I can't speak to that. Um, I don't want to speak to the details. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm just curious if there is any learning cross program happening there within your agency. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can tell you even the 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 arc of my career has spanned from, um, you know, shrinking cities to sinking cities, essentially. So, you know, I definitely see the the parallels. Um, you know, Marissa's right, though, there, there are uh, in some ways, more more intervention opportunities in um, uh, you know shrinking cities thing, right? Like so, the same flexible funding sources that I mentioned uh, that are under my purview are being used for economic recovery from COVID, and were used uh, for economic recovery from from two thousand eight as well. So, you know, you can. Ultimately, it comes down to uh, you know what the the local government working with its residents decides they need to do. Um, but I think you're exactly right that there, there can and, and should be parallels. I mean, even just looking, I think you brought up Detroit or someone brought up Detroit uh, near, near where I grew up. And one of the big questions there at the time when I was in planning school was, you know, can there's an understanding that the overall population of, of Detroit and other cities has shrunk significantly and that the infrastructure was built up um, for a certain size population. But there were several open questions. One, you know, where, um, where have people left, right? Did they abandon whole neighborhoods or pieces of neighborhoods, right? And then second question, um, can you shut off parts of infrastructure? And in, in this case, would there be cost savings associated with it? Um, uh, in another life, I ran a survey that had, um, we hired 30 people to drive every single street in the city of Detroit and actually figure out uh, where there was abandonment. Um, and, you know, it was not whole neighborhoods, right? I mean, I think we know this at this point, but it was a couple houses here, a couple houses there, that sort of a thing. Um, so I do think that there's a lot to be learned from um, those experiences, both in terms of, you know, um, the importance of a, of, a, of a really community led and engaged effort. So you're not just creating these like one off interventions on a block um, and leading, leading to a patchwork, but also in what you do with aging infrastructure and how that comes into play as well. Yeah, and, and if I could just put even a finer point on that, I think one really important piece that we that we learned from you know engaging with our partners at the local level is that um, you know the the underlying inequity is the same right in terms of who you know uh, people that are asked to move you know historically um, from a climate perspective it's again looking at that redlining um, the segregation the disinvestment in communities 
of course, climate change exacerbates this, but you know, his, historically, even from you know, sort of the, the investment in the interstate highway system, um, you know, and even prior to that, you know, Indian Removal Act, like all of these history of uh, black and brown and indigenous communities that have been impacted by um, investments in some cases, and then the subsequent disinvestment that may have happened from those investments. They're the, the people often that have contributed to stewarding our environment um, and have been the one who've been displaced and continue to be displaced today. So I just you know, wanted to sort of emphasize that in many cases, communities that have um, are, are disconnected as a result of this dis disinvestment um, that can happen at this community scale, but also um, facing the climate migration and, and they're absolutely um, interconnected. Uh, and, and if that's something that the planning community, I think, can learn, um, you know, that would be a really important piece to, to really bring both to this disinvestment piece and the idea that climate is going to exacerbate that. This, uh, you know, the community has been resonating throughout all of our conversations, right, that these need to be communal decisions and community-based decisions. And yet I keep coming back to the idea that buyouts are an individual homeowner decision, right? Uh, Rhonda, you've probably seen this voluntary buyouts where you get, you know, the checkerboard. You get one person who says yes and one person who says no. And what do you do about that, right? So I'd love to hear thoughts from all of you. And maybe Rhonda will start with you. But like, what can we do? Do we need a whole new program? Do we need to change the buyout program? What can we do to support community relocation rather than homeowner relocation? Yeah, Rhonda. Sure. So I'm the chief resilience officer. So it's in my best interest to have these areas that would be bought out so that we could have pockets that we could help build resilience for our community. Um, but it's hard because the local community doesn't want that. They want it to be voluntary. So my, to, to me, I guess you would, we would have to make um, sweeten the pot to able to like, we need these pockets. Okay, yes, they're voluntary, but can we sweeten the pot for the buyouts? How can we make it attractive so that we can get this whole neighborhood of homes bought out? I think that's probably um, the way I see it happening. I just don't see the mandatory um, making people sell. I don't, that's going to be really difficult. And, you know, unless it's, you know, we reach that point where it's just so much inundation coming up, but building up to the plan, if you really want to do the long term, I, you know, sweeten the pot and how can we help these people want to move? But then again, when you do that, you have to do that alternate look. Okay, who are the people that are leaving? Are, are these four school teachers and three sheriff's office and four local government workers office? Well, what are we going to do now? If they leave, where are they going? In the Keys, it's in our island community, it's not so easy. We can't just put them a mile up the road because it's going to be similar. So that's a, maybe more relevant here to the Florida Keys, but that's another very relevant decision we're going to have to make. We're maybe going to have to, we're already doing it, but maybe we're going to have to look at you know affordable um, housing where if we're relocating people here, we can offer them a spot where they can relocate, whether it's a rental or a, or a purchase. But someplace where it's high and dry and it might not be a, a single family home, but at least it's a place where they can relocate that's attractive and not a downgrade in what they're in their living um, space. Things like that is, is what I think will help. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. Eric, I'm curious, you know, at FEMA in terms of buyouts, aside from like sweetening the pot and, you know, looking at your budget, offer more money, of course. Uh, what else can, what can FEMA do to help support sort of community relocation rather than individual homeowners? Or is that a direction you see FEMA going? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I think number one, I think a lot of a lot of your questions, um, one of the things we need to do is figure out what is the outcome we want to achieve mm. with, with climate migration and what is the appropriate role of federal, state, um, and local government and NGOs. Uh, um, if, you know, the, the administration, uh, the president came over to FEMA and announced a billion dollars for our, our Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program pre-disaster. That, that's a billion dollars. Rhonda can probably um, use all of that in just funding a couple of projects in Monroe County uh, pretty quick. You know, I think the, the idea of scaling up uh, what, what is needed, um, you know, if you look at We've looked at the communities that we have relocated. It hasn't happened in one sub-application over one year. It's happened in multiple sub-applications over multiple years because, as you as you mentioned, every homeowner has to decide if they want to move and when. And typically, you know, once people get 
get their home wet once or twice. They, they want to stay once it's like three or four times they're, they're done. Um, you know, and, and with climate change, that's probably going to continue. Um, there's an outstanding GAO report that came out uh, last year that kind of looked at um, uh, what is needed in terms of achieving this outcome of moving communities at this kind of a scale. And, you know, I think the question for a, a consideration for policymakers is uh, how do we achieve that outcome with our existing programs or something else, you know, needed to um, uh, just scale up what we're already doing. FEMA will continue to, for those communities that are interested, um, and we just announced uh, one uh, this a few months ago, Princeville, North Carolina, an impoverished community, helping them relocate some of their homes and uh, infrastructure out of the floodplain. And we will continue to fund those projects um, over time. And we now have new, you know, more funding than we've ever had before, uh, you know, to help with this. But I think the question is, what is really needed in the long term? Again, going back to the National Climate Assessment and looking at, you mentioned the repetitive loss structure numbers going up. Um, what is needed in the long term to help us achieve um, this outcome and looking at affordable and resilient housing and looking at um, maintaining community cohesiveness. I think that's, um, uh, so to your question, FEMA's role, we're gonna continue the dollars that are appropriated to us. We're gonna continue um, making them available and fund the best projects that we can and supporting the communities who would like to you know, take advantage of them. I like it. Uh we're down to our final minute. So any final thoughts, Marissa or Kevin, that you'd like to leave the panel with? Marissa, go ahead. We'll yeah, start I you. mean, I think, you know, one, buyouts are one tool for managed retreat, right? And again, I'm coming to this from a community development perspective and, you know, for vulnerable uh, folks, people of color, renters, they take time. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. And, and so I think it's one, one tool uh, and, and I think, how can we approach managed retreat within this larger con context of resilient community development? Again, affordable housing, but also transportation, hospitals, green spaces, jobs, um, you know, and, and, and thinking about the interplay between communities uh, and, and, and supporting, you know, and understanding the impacts and potential unintended consequences of, you know, if one community takes uh, action and what's the impact on another. So, you know, I think, Again, nonprofits are are really trying to weave these uh, programs together and 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 support some of that um, need on the ground. Um, but I think you know thinking about it comprehensively is is where we need to go. Kevin, last words. Couldn't agree more. Uh, if you're one of the many Americans that has less than a thousand dollars in your checking account, you don't have a lot of choices. Um, if the plant closes in your neighborhood, or if your the rental housing you live in continues to flood. Um, and we need to focus on addressing those those underlying needs. Uh, you know, I've seen that firsthand going to uh, community meetings and libraries to talk about flooding and getting an earful about not being able to buy groceries next week. Um, I think, you know, to the extent that we address um, the resilience of, of individuals and neighborhoods to a variety of threats will make us more prepared for uh, the big climate crisis that we have to deal with now. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I think we've raised a lot of amazing questions today. I can't say I think we've solved a lot of them, but it's wonderful to have that conversation. So thank you, Marissa, Kevin, Rhonda, and Eric for joining. And uh, back to you, Bradley. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Siders, Kevin, Eric, Rhonda, and Marissa. That was, that was really an amazing discussion. I'm already getting emails about how great it was on what at times can, can be quite a fairly contentious topic, uh, but certainly something that we'll face over the coming years. Um, we've already seen some comments in the chat uh, about our next storyteller and, and the community he's going to be talking about. Uh, I think the title of his story is absolutely perfect. It is The Day the Piano Went Up the Hill. Dennis Knobloch currently serves as um, the Monroe County, Illinois Commissioner and as Administrator for the vi Village of Valmire. He was elected to serve as the Mayor of Valmire, Illinois, for two terms from 1989 to 1995. Following the village's almost total devastation from the flooding of the Mississippi River in 1993, he helped guide the community through a recovery effort that included a buyout of the flood damaged properties and a relocation of the entire village to higher ground. Uh, thank you for joining us, Commissioner Nava. 
Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, very good. Uh, yes, uh, my presentation today is called The Day the Piano Went Up the Hill. Tell you a little bit about our community to start off with. Valmar is located about 35 miles southeast of St. Louis, just across the Mississippi River in Southern Illinois. The main part of our original town sets adjacent to the Illinois River Bluff and is about four miles from the main channel of the Mississippi River. During the late 1960s, when I was sitting in my high school history class, I would listen to stories about World War II. And even though much of it had taken place less than 25 years earlier, I considered it to be ancient history. Never in my life had I stood in floodwater up to that point. So Valmar's experiences with flooding also seemed like ancient history to me. The worst series of floods hit Valmar during the 1940s. Graduation exercises at Valmar High School had to be canceled in 1943 because there was three feet of water on the school grounds. Boats were used to travel on Main Street. When the water receded, the residents quickly shoveled out the mud, scrubbed down their walls, and moved back into their homes. But the Mississippi had other ideas. Flooding followed again in 1944 and 1947. Suffering three major floods during that five-year period was more than many of the residents and local farmers could handle. They rallied with their elected representatives, and between 1947 and 1950, a 35 mile long earthen levee was built by the US Army Corps of Engineers along the entire length of our county. Didn't only protect Almar, but also the 60,000 acre floodplain of our county. This levee was touted by the Corps as one of the best it had ever built. And for many years, it successfully provided protection as it was meant to. By the early 1980s, I had married a high school classmate and we had settled into a Valmire home to raise our three children. About that same time, FEMA rolled into town with a fresh set of floodplain maps, which our local government was asked to adopt. Accepting the information on the maps would allow our residents to purchase flood insurance, but it would also carry with it some major restrictions. The new regulations would require that any new construction had to be at least one foot above the base flood elevation. On average, that meant that most new property in Balmer would have to be on elevated mounds or on stilts 10 feet above the ground. As is probably evident, that meant the end of new construction in the community. One of the things I found amusing about these new maps was that in the depiction of a park on the east side of town, it indicated that in the case of a 100 year flood, water would cover first base on the park's baseball diamond, but third base would remain dry. How ridiculous was that? And I was not shy about telling each and every FEMA representative what I thought about their maps. A village committee was formed to try to overturn the regulations. Our levee had protected the entire area since 1950 when it was completed, and there was no reason to believe it wouldn't continue to do so. Not much progress was made with our efforts, and in 1989, I was asked to run for mayor to help lead the battle against FEMA and their floodplain regulations. My first four-year term passed with no progress, and the time came to decide if I would continue as mayor. One evening at dinner, I presented the subject to my wife and children. The kids really didn't have much to say, but my wife was quick to reply, why not run? Nothing ever happens in sleepy little Valor. April of 1993, I was elected to my second term as mayor. And around that same time, the river levels started to quickly rise. Still no immediate concern, but by June, that situation had changed. 
a weather front stalled over the Midwest and it rained and rained day after day after day. River levels continued to rise and by July, we had started our flood fight battle with the Mississippi. Every day, 24 hours a day. During the entire period, our local fire firehouse had become the flood command center and was also the information center for local residents. Every day before heading off to work, residents would stop by the firehouse to check on the river level and the status of the lake. In addition, there was a group of retirees who would head to the command center each morning to get their daily dose of information and fresh hot coffee. I had shared some information with these folks that I later regretted. I had total faith in the integrity of our levee system, and I was sure that the flood fight would only last for a short time and the river in our lives would return to normal. There was no reason to leave town or even pack belongings because my feet were dry and they were going to stay that way. One morning I had told the coffee clutch about a battle that was brewing at my house. Several years earlier, we had purchased a new piano and it was the centerpiece in our home's formal living area. Our children had started taking lessons on that new piano. Every day I was reminded by my wife about how she didn't want to see anything happen to this beautiful new piece of furniture. He felt that if floodwaters did somehow come into town, I would be too busy to head home to save the piano. I continued to fend off her concerns by telling her that we were still being protected by that well-built core levee and our piano would be staying dry. It was also important to me that all of our residents stay positive and continue to fight hard to beat the rising river. If all of a sudden they saw the mayor packing his things and hauling them to higher ground, that could deflate the balloon. Every day I would be quizzed by the coffee drinkers. Well, how are things with the mayor's piano today? And every day I would tell them the piano is still in our living room and that's where it's going to stay. Henry was the ringleader of the group and he wasn't going to move anything from his house unless the mayor did. July 25th, it was a Sunday afternoon. Mississippi was 16 and a half feet over flood stage in our area at that time. And sand boils were causing major concerns both north and south of our town. Some of the surrounding towns had called for evacuation and our leaders were thinking the same thing might be necessary. That afternoon, we relented. We issued a voluntary evacuation order. We told residents that it would make sense for them to pack valuables and furniture and move it to higher ground. There was still no concern about the levee, but why not safeguard those things that you cherish? In a matter of minutes, the phone at the command center rang and it was my wife. She said several friends from out of town he had just heard the announcement. They had back trucks up to our front door asking if they could help move things out of our house. I told her no. She said, but I said, no. Hung up. Several minutes later, the phone rang again. And once more, she was pleading for the removal of valuables from our home, including, of course, the new piano. I finally gave in and they continued without any further concerns of wet feet. The next morning, the usual crew of coffee drinkers rolled in and I was greeted with the usual, how are things with the mayor's piano? I looked at Henry and said, sorry, Henry, but yesterday the piano went up the hill. Henry didn't respond. He just turned and walked out the door and went home to pack. By Sunday, August 1st, with the river 19 and a half feet over flood stage, water began to overtop a levee to our north. By 4 a.m. on Monday, August 2nd, water started rolling into our town and it took three days for the water to fill the 60,000 acre river basin surrounding us. By Wednesday, we had water levels up to 16 feet, along with swift currents and large items of floating debris. 
Much of our town was underwater for more than two months. Property assessments by helicopter and boat revealed that we had a significant amount of damage and eventually it would be determined that more than 90% of our structures fell into the substantial damage category. Oh, and did I mention that park on the east side of our town? The one that had been depicted on the 1980 floodplain maps? Well, just as pictured, first base was underwater and third base was dry. And you can imagine, I heard, we told you so on more than one occasion. After several community meetings that had to be held in uphill neighboring towns, it became apparent that many of our residents were not interested in staying in their homes. A member of our regional planning commission contacted us and suggested the idea of trying to relocate the town. That was before Moving a town had a fancy name like managed retreat as we do today. I thought he was crazy as did many of our other town residents, but if this was the only way that we could save our community, I decided to listen to his thoughts. Eventually we presented the idea at another series of community meetings and a majority of our residents voted to support the move. Within a matter of weeks, we brought more than 100 of our residents to the table and we gave them the task of planning the details of what would become their new town. Village officials identified a plot of land about a mile and a half from our former town location, but the important number was that this new location was 400 feet higher in elevation than our flooded community. By this time, many of our village residents we're living in a neighboring community in a settlement of FEMA mobile homes, affectionately known as FEMAville. Less than two months, our citizens completed a preliminary plan for moving Valmar to higher ground. And one week later, I was testifying before Congress about the plans for moving Valmar. By the second week of December in 93, we had broken ground on the new town site. We had not yet turned the calendar to 1994, and we were on the downhill run of relocating our community. Only it had been that easy. We had quite a few problems along the way. Plans for relocating the town would fail if we could not secure enough buyout funds to cover all of the residents of our town. And multiple states had been involved in the 1993 flood event so finding enough funds was not an easy project. As we started our examination of the relocation site, it became evident that we had selected a great site for a village because 5,000 years earlier, another group of people had that same idea. We had to do quite a few archeological investigations to clear the site. It was determined that there were shag bark hickory trees on the new development site that were the breeding habitat for Indiana bats. So we had to mitigate that problem. Eventually it was discovered that a neighboring quarry company had purchased the mineral rights under the property we planned to develop. State and federal agencies saw this as a cloud on the title of the property. So we didn't have any choice as a village. We had to buy a limestone quarry to clear up that problem. Despite all of the problems, we began to turn a cornfield into a new town. Infrastructure and streets were added, mostly complete by the end of 95, and residents were able to start moving into their homes in 1996. Many of the current students at Valmar School regard stories of the 1993 flood as ancient history because they were born after that event and they never experienced wet feet due to a flood. Hopefully this and future generations of our community will be students of history and will learn from the experience of their ancestors. Reloading, relocating Valmar to higher ground has not been easy and recovery took longer than expected, but we're happy to have grown our population from the pre-flood 900 to now more than 1200 residents. And looking back, we feel the right decision was made. 
One thing is for certain, when Valmar residents hear a knock at their door, they don't have to worry that it's their former destructive and uncontrollable neighbor, the Mississippi River. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Knobloch. Uh, your story is essential for our audience to hear. Um, an unfortunate disaster, but a monumental effort to move an entire community, and that takes a significant amount of leadership. Another thanks to all our speakers for an impactful second day of, of the Alliances for Climate Action Forum series. We appreciate your willingness to participate in this event and hope to build on these conversations as we move forward. Next week, our focus will be on stories that inspire action. We will comp uh, combine panel discussion with the stories of individuals who are actively working to address this key climate issue with perspectives from a faith leader, community-based organization, youth advocate, journalist, uh, tribal representative, uh, global resilience at the city level, environmental justice, and the arts. We hope you will join us. If you are not part of the Resilient Nation Partnership Network and wish to join and be added to our distribution list for information, please send a note to fema-resilientnation at fema.dhs.gov. Um, I also did wanna share that there is a webinar that's about to start with FEMA, uh, HUD, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, and the Environmental Protection Agency beginning at 2 p.m., so literally in one minute on the importance of partnerships for FEMA's grant program. So that information can be found. We'll drop it in the chat for everyone. And I wanna say thank you all for joining us today. And we look forward to convening with you again next week. Thank you. <laughs>